Welcome to this soul lifting broadcast, which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness common right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. How to survive relationship storms, how to survive relationship storms. I wanted to call your, your, your friend if you uh, went home alone in the car, on the train, wherever you are right now, or in the gathering, uh, you know, take distractions away from you, get somebody who needs to listen to this, encourage them also to go to our YouTube channel and binge watch uh, the, the messages in the series. Last uh, Sunday was very, very powerful. And I, I want love in his image. Uh, you know, I want you to go ahead and watch that. You know, it, it, it's also very powerful. We also have some, uh, I'm sure by now, some video expressions of what happened in some of our physical gatherings, uh, um, uh, vow renewal uh, in, in one of our services uh, in those physical gatherings was powerful. Uh, you know, marriages were healed, hearts were mended, people were encouraged, we celebrate success in marriages. We're not only going to be emphasizing what the devil is doing, we also want to emphasize what God is doing. For one relationship that has failed, there are 10 relationships that are standing and standing strong. And we celebrate the gift of God in our lives, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our business partnerships, in you know, in career partnerships, in different things that God is doing, God who, who you know, who is the one that plants us in a relationship, who says he, he put the solitaries in families for a purpose, which is companionship, that our lives can gain progress. He said it's not good that man should be alone and will make him a helper. And he's still making up till now. He's still connecting people. It's still, you know, bringing people together. It's still orchestrating destinies. And I pray this season that God, our God, is orchestrating uh, great connections into your life in the name of Jesus. And for as many that need, you know, a, a, a great connection to fulfill their marital destiny, my God is orchestrating your portion this season in the name of Jesus. You will not lack, uh, you know, of, of, of a loving mate in the name of the Lord Jesus. And for anyone who may have gone through a relationship storm, whatever kind of relationship storm, uh, a separation, a divorce, or several, you know, broken relationships that are supposed to have led into a marriage. And maybe now you, you've taken uh, some kind of sabbatical and you're telling yourself, you know, I, I, I can't kill myself. I, 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 don't, I don't want to become an emotional wreck. You know, I've tried, but things are not working. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. Can you hear me tell somebody that's around you there? Say, God has a plan for your life. Uh, go into the chat room if you're on any of our social media platform. Say, write it there. Say, God has a plan for my life. Glory be to Jesus. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. And when we align with his plans for us, his will starts to unfold in our lives. And that's why I'm bringing you this great word this morning, uh, how to survive relationship storms, how to survive relationship storms. And, you know, the principal focus as we go on with this message is uh, the, the, the young lady called Ruth in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, I'll read from verse 12 to 17 in the New King James Version. How to survive relationship storms, whatever storm that the enemy may be bringing into your life right now. I declare today uh, that this season, storms will be calm and you will survive. You will not only survive that relationship storm, you will recover. Whether it's at work, it's at home, in the neighborhood, in your marriage, uh, among siblings, with your parents, whatever relationship storm that the enemy may have brought into your life this season. Uh, I pray over you that you will not only survive, you will recover all in the precious name of Jesus. Let's look at this wonderful story, the story of Ruth, uh, 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 who belonged to, you know, the family of Elimelech, who was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the husband of Naomi. And Ruth happened to be their sister-in-law. If you haven't read the book of Ruth before, I want to encourage you to read it. Uh, it's a very short book in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Uh, but this, this, this story connected with the lineage and the genealogy of Christ. Uh, and it's just an, an encouraging story that God comes true for people. That when we hold on to God, God shows up for us. And that's going to be the testimony of somebody in the precious name of Jesus. Ruth chapter 1, I read from verse 12. Uh, turn back, my daughters. This is Naomi speaking to Ruth 
after Ruth's husband, who happens to be Naomi's son, had died. Naomi had two, two sons, if I can just backtrack a bit. Naomi had two sons, and the two of them, Malon and Shilon, they died. Elimelech, her own husband, died. It started with Elimelech, and then the two sons. And then at this point, Ruth, I mean, Naomi wanted to release the two daughters-in-law so, so that they can just go and do whatever they want to do with their lives. But look at this. He said, in verse 12 of Ruth chapter 1, Turn back, my daughter. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from being, from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the end of the Lord has gone out against you. You know, when we're going through trouble, we feel that God is against us. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, look, look at the next verse. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Ophah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. I love that word. Clung to her. Held on tightly to her and said, look, your sister-in-law, this is Naomi spoke now. I'm mean speaking now. Naomi spoke out and said, uh, she said uh, to, 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 to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. I love that. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, it says, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. The Lord bless the reading of his word. It's a very interesting demonstration of commitment to the will of God, commitment to divine purpose, commitment to divine orchestration, uh, a show of conviction in the relationship that Ruth had with Naomi and the entire Elimelech family. Now, it's important at this point, before I go any further, to make somebody understand that something is, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is, <laughs> is being removed consistently from our relational life you know, as modernization uh, starts to creep in, as people start to think that relationships are not that of a big deal. You can go with this or go with that. I can be with this person or be with that person. The place of a Christian relationship that is rooted in a divine conviction as is gradually being eroded. And if you're single, please listen to me today, that God still... Puts, gives us direction and conviction about who to go with and who not to go with. About which opportunity is your opportunity. Perhaps you've been single for quite a bit. Uh, you're mature single. You, 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 you know, you, you're in your middle age and you're still single. The possibility is that you, 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 know, you become that kind of agitated. If you've gone maybe past agitated or anxiety, you just, you just give me anything anybody would do. God's will is not anything or anybody. Yeah. God is the one that puts a conviction in our heart. God definitely gave Ruth a conviction in our heart at this point. And I just feel like digressing and saying it to somebody. And somebody who may even be going through a storm now in a relationship. And you're about to jump ship. Because you just feel, you know, Con conviction, my, 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 my foot, this pain is too much, uh, you know, away I go. But before you go, you need to ask a question. What is God saying? What is God saying? So when life happens, love, hope, and trust may fail, 
But God will never leave us nor forsake us. And he still wants to speak to us even in the midst of a storm. Yeah, in the midst of a storm. The presence of God is not the absence of storm. It's that God can still be with us in the midst of a storm. He is the peace in the midst of the storm. Jesus was in the inner part of the boat with his disciples. He didn't stop the storm from coming against their boat. But the fact that he was present there guaranteed that that storm will not overpower them and it will not kill them. And I pray over somebody here today that the storm that you're going through right now will not overwhelm you, it will not overpower you, and it will not see your hand. You will see its end. Uh, can somebody say a bigger amen to that? Glory be to Jesus. Uh, so the best marriages, the best relationships, whether it's a, it's a business partnership, it's a romantic relationship, it's a marriage, the best of relationships, we encounter storms. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus told you know, the story about the man, who, he said, who is a wise man? Uh, the one who built his house on the rock. And he said the wind came. And, you know, so whether uh, it's um, whatever kind of relationship, the best of relationships, whether a relationship is great or a relationship is bad, all relationships will face their storm. It depends on how you have built your house. And we've dealt a bit on that, the foundational issues. Go back to, I mean, going back to some of the previous messages, you can listen to some of the foundational issues. We talked about, uh, you know, seven foundational agreements that are necessary for a marriage. And, and, and I wanted to go back and, and, and watch and listen to that. But you need to understand that the Bible says in Luke 17 and verse number one, the big part, it said it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Yeah. And what does it mean? It means that <laughs> offenses will come. <laughs> it means that storms will come. Winds will come. They come to test the metal, uh, you know, of your relationship, the foundation of your relationship, the strength of your relationship. Uh, they're not coming, you know, to destroy what you're building because God will, will, will take you through it and you will become stronger. Say amen, somebody. Glory be to Jesus. Ruth uh, was a classic, a classic Example of experiencing a storm with major setbacks. Young lady got married. Looked, I mean, what happened to Elimelech and his family looked like a COVID experience. But how do you ex explain that the man of the house, Elimelech, would just die like that? And then Mylon and Shilon, the, 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 the sons, will also just go like that. Something just came and ravaged the male in the house like a virus or something. And it was a, a, a huge storm, starting with Naomi, losing her husband, then losing two sons, and then Ruth, a young lady, who was just starting her own life. Because sometimes, you, you, you know, we blame God when we go through situations. God, why didn't you stop me from marrying into this family? Why didn't you stop me from marrying this supposed knucklehead? Why didn't you stop me from doing this and that? Sometimes it's too late to be saying all those things is to be able to ask God the question, how do I survive this storm that I'm in? The storm is already here. Ruth experienced a storm. Yeah. And she also offered us an amazing encouragement about working by faith. Yeah, in our relationships with God. Working by faith, holding God true to his word. She highlights the, you know, the place of revelation and conviction in, in, the, in, in, in relationships. The fact that there's a place for revelation knowledge. There's a place of understanding that God has planted me here. And until God says no, I remain in the place I have been planted. The Bible describes one of the metaphors in the scripture with which the Bible describes believers. He said we are trees of righteousness. Trees are planted. They that are planted in the house of God, the Bible says they will flourish in the courts of our God. Have you been planted in a relationship? Don't uproot yourself prematurely. Hear what God is saying. God may have a bigger plan. The storm notwithstanding. No storm lasts forever. Say amen, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the Holy Spirit encourages us when we're in storms. One time I was going through a storm personally and the Holy Spirit you know, asked me a question. Have you seen a storm that started and continued? And continued. Even the hurricane doesn't last forever. It comes and then 
it passes. And that's it. And I pray for somebody. Uh, whether you just survived a storm or the storm is still on, this storm will come to pass. And if you have survived a storm, then God is bringing you into recovery in the precious name of Jesus. Somebody shout a believing amen. Glory be to Jesus. Uh, so it, it's important that we understand that revelation, instruction, and obedience are the things that lead to, you know, to, 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 to restoration. Revelation, instruction, obedience will lead us into restoration and recovery in, in many relationships, even when the devil attacks, just like it happened in the life of Ruth. Now, three big thoughts. Three big thoughts for recovering. Surviving and recovering from a storm, especially a relationship storm. Number one. Hold on to God, the architect, and strengthen uh, your destiny and marriage. Is the architect. When you hold on to him, is the architect, the strengthener of your, your you know, uh, it strengthens your destiny and your marriage. The architect and the strengthener of our marriage, uh, of our destiny, it, it, everything is all about him. When we hold on to him, we can receive strength from him. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, uh, 36, and 37. It says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. He said, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And I say to anyone who is trusting God uh, for a, uh, a life partner, I say, yet a little while, he who will come, will come. She who will come, will come, and will not tarry. In the name of Jesus. Say, now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. There's something about holding on to God. That was what Ruth did. It's, she saw Naomi as the symbolism of God. And she held on. What God has said is this is the place. This is where to be. Stay here. And she held on to Naomi. And walked with Naomi. Went back, you know, to Bethlehem with Naomi. Settle with Naomi. Are you walking away from the will of God? Or are you going to walk into the will of God and continue to walk in the will of God? So, hold on to the one who gave you your marriage, your vision, your hope, and the relationship. Hold on to him. He's the giver of all good things. If you want to survive a relationship storm, you have to hold on to God. Hold on to God in prayers and confession. And by act of faith based on revelation. Can I say that one more time? Hold on to God in prayers. Hold on to God watching the confession of your mouth. Speaking the word of God, speaking life over yourself, over your relationship, and over the principal actors in that relationship. And hold on by the, the, you know, the act of faith that is based on revelation. I don't know the revelation that Ruth had, but each and every one of us, we, we need our own revelation about the storm that we're going through. You know, people behave in different ways when a storm comes, when crisis comes. In the face of crisis or a storm, some people react. <laughs> in the face of, you know, of, of, of crisis and, and, uh, uh, and a storm, some people wait for revelation. There's a difference between revelation and reaction. Yeah. Uh, uh, reaction is just, you know, uh, I just react. I just act, I just act based on impulse. But revelation... It's what I get that shapes my conviction and redirects my action. Can I say that one, one more time? Revelation, when it dawns on you, it shapes your conviction and then it dictates your action. It dictates your action. It dictates your action. A responsible person, a responsible believer, does not just react to anything. We move based on revelation. 
we move based on, that was what the difference between Ophir and, uh, uh, and Ruth. One responded to the storm and everything, lost hope in that place and in that family, and let's forget everything. While Ruth said, where you go, I will go. The God shall be my God. Something told her there's something about the God of Naomi and Elimelech, the God of Bethlehem, the place of bread. That God, that God, something has happened in our heart. What is happening in your heart in the midst of your storm? Is your conviction still strong to hold on to God? Are you still praying about that relationship? Or have you jettisoned any act of prayer? Do you still pray for that spouse who may be misbehaving right now? Yeah. Are you concerned about the state at which your relationships are breaking? Are you going back to God to be able to speak to him so he will direct you, order your steps, and give you wisdom? Or are you giving up and saying, look, I've tried. I've tried. Maybe I'm not supposed to be in a relationship. Maybe I'm supposed to be alone. Maybe I'm supposed to be depressed and dis despondent. Maybe this is my own life. Though I don't know how, why God would make my life be like this, that's what some people would be saying, you know, rather than saying, look, there's, there, there, there's always a way out. There's always something that God is about to do. So it's time to hold on to God in prayer. Ask God for specific instructions and wisdom and direction. And make sure, you know, that you're getting incremental wisdom. You know, wisdom may be in simple things. May be to change how you think. It may be to change your action, to change how you speak, to change, you know, uh, how you appear, what you say, and the places that you go, how you react in certain situations. Something that may be repelling somebody. And as you gain knowledge of all these things, I want you to understand that one act of faith can birth a full session of testimonies and recovery. Just one act of faith. Action taken in obedience to God. You know, many times in my own personal life, one simple act of faith in obedience to God, like God just saying, slow down, apologize to your spouse, that thing that you said you would never do, go and do it. You know, some people will say, over my dead body, as if they created themselves. <laughs> That's why things are dying around you. If you keep saying those kind of things, you need to slow down and say, look, God, you, Holy Spirit, you want me to do this before I commit <laughs> my death to it. Yeah. Because that's how things get destroyed in the hands of people when you go through a storm or crisis and you no longer watch what you say. You no longer, you know, lean on divine conviction. You just feel anything should go. Many people will have recovered faster <laughs> from storms if only they will keep holding on to God. Only they will keep holding on to God. The place of instruction is very important when it comes to recovering, when it comes to surviving a storm. In, in, in John chapter 2, the, the marriage at Cana of Galilee, you know they ran out of storm. I mean, sorry, they ran out of wine. <laughs> they ran out of wine. It was more like a storm was brewing, was about to come into that situation. Something was going to go wrong. But what Mary told the disciples of Christ, uh, or told the, 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 the people who, who put the party together, sorry, was to, you know, take instruction. John chapter 2, what do you read from verse 5 to 7? His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And that's what I'm saying to somebody who is going through a storm. Somebody who just went through a storm and is looking up to God for recovery. What is God saying to you this season? Is there something that God is saying to you that, that, that sounds strange to you? Yeah. Show up. Go for counseling. It may sound strange to you. I don't want any third party in my relationship. That's ignorance speaking. Yeah. Because you need to align with what God is saying. Go and apologize. Start sending resources to that person. Yeah. Visit your parents. Do something differently. That person that you've said you will never speak to again, God may be saying it's time to, you know, to broker peace. Mary told the servants, whatever I says to you, do it. The Bible says now there were 
uh, six, uh, six, they were set there, six water pots of, of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing uh, 20 and 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. Jesus said, go and fill it up with water. Put water inside, inside these things. And, you know, in their mind, they'll be thinking, but well, we need wine, not water. It's not water we're looking for. It's wine. And Jesus said, no, this is what you put in. And sometimes what God will be telling you to do in the midst of your storm and the midst of your recovery may not look like what will bring recovery, what will bring a change. It may look bland. It may look like something painful or unexciting. But God expects that you will obey the instruction. Because in the midst of your obedience, God shows up. God shows up. God shows up. God shows up. That's what happened in this John chapter 2, marriage at Canal Galilee experience. God showed up. The second thing that I want to speak to today, you know, I said three thoughts on surviving relationship storm. The second one is sow seeds for the harvest that you want to see. What am I saying? You know, in, in Christendom, when we say seed, we're talking about adding value. Keep adding value. Don't stop adding value. That's what I'm talking about. Don't stop adding value. Your, my seed is the value that's coming out of me. Yeah. Everybody has need, but we also have seeds to sow. It's in sowing my seed that I meet a need. And then it's reciprocated, and it doesn't have to be direct reciprocation. God can use somebody else to meet my need also, who also has the seed of the need that I have. And, you know, when we've gone through a crisis, there's a whole lot of discouragement that comes with, with the relationship storm uh, uh, that you just feel, look, I don't want to add value to anybody again. I just want to be on my own. I want to do my own thing. Does that sound familiar to somebody? Because that's what we say. <laughs> I just want to be on my own. I just, you know, I want to do me. I, 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 I'm tired of all these people. They, everybody's, you know, they're just hypocrites. Family members, hypocrites. Church members, hypocrites. Neighbors, hypocrites. Colleagues at work, all of them hypocrites. I just want to live my life. You know, you share your, your pain with somebody, they use it against you. You don't want to connect with anybody. But you remember from the book of the beginning, God said, it's not good that man should be alone or woman should be alone. We are created for connection, not isolation. Your pain notwithstanding, the original divine agenda of God for your life is that you enjoy strong companionship, connect with other people. That's how our lives appreciate. Don't allow your pain or the storm to take you away from God's divine agenda. Glory be to Jesus. So, you won't stop adding value. Because when you add value, when you sow your seed, look at Ruth chapter 2. After everything that has happened in Ruth chapter 2, uh, when Naomi and Ruth got to Bethlehem, Naomi located the family house. They didn't have anything to eat. They didn't have anything. And so Ruth, the Bible says, in verse 2 of Ruth chapter 2, so Ruth the Moabites said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. This was Ruth trying to add value. Then the Bible says she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened. Somebody say happened. Uh, it, it says it happened. This looks like happened stands. But the Bible says the steps of the just, you know, the steps of a good man. says they are ordered by God. Our intention to keep adding value. Made God order a step to the field that belongs to, uh, you know, Boaz. The Bible says there, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. God that wanted to bring restoration into her life caused her to walk into a field. But how did that happen? When they got to Bethlehem, she was still thinking of adding value to Naomi. She didn't just say, oh, Naomi, I followed you here since this, uh, 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 when your village, when the midst of your people. So you go and talk to them and tell them that, you know, I used to be, I mean, uh, that uh, I'm your, your daughter-in-law. You need to take care of me and fix me. She didn't behave like, you know, uh, Naomi's baggage that Naomi had to carry. She turned Naomi, Naomi to her own responsibility. Even in the midst of her pain, 
How do you survive a relationship storm? You, you, you keep sowing your seed, keep adding value to people. Even in the midst of everything, you may not know how everything is going to turn out, but you have a seed. You have some value to add. You have something to give. So be mindful of the seed you sow in a storm or in your waiting period. Can I say that one more time? Be mindful of the seed that you are sowing in the midst of the storm or in your waiting period. Some people feel that in their waiting period or in the midst of their storm, they are excused from sowing seed. It makes recovery a long journey. Don't sow out of bitterness. It doesn't bring the right result. Don't retain bitterness from the bad experience. Yeah, don't sow out of bitterness. Sow out of a good heart. Add value out of a good heart. You know, uh, the Bible talks about root of bitterness, seed of discord, and it reminds me of, of, of uh, you know, what we call bile, bile. In, uh, when I was younger, uh, when, when we, we have, uh, you know, small get-togethers and parties and all that in the family, you know, we kill chickens and, and all, and then they will say, oh, come, come, come and help, help us chop it into smaller bits that we, we can easily uh, prepare for the meal and all. And when you're doing that, my, I remember my parents would say, be careful of the bile. It's a very tiny green stuff that is attached to the liver. It's also in other mammals and other animals. The bile is very bitter from what I heard. And uh, 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 it has a particular function in, in, in the body. But when you are chopping off the different parts you know, of the chicken, if you mistakenly slice the bile, it destroys the entire meat, the entire chicken. Yeah, it destroys everything. In the midst of our pain sometimes, we don't know that we have allowed the bile to fill our heart, and that's what we're giving out. So what we're giving out is bitterness. And if you don't watch your heart very well, you lose the capacity to add value because the bitterness that you're giving out is looking like wickedness to other people. So as I emphasize the need for you to keep adding value, keep sowing seed, make sure that it's coming from a good place. Make sure that you, 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 you have not allowed bitterness to pervade and permeate your heart. So, like a good gardener, fight anything that seeks to strangle or suffocate your seed or to take the efficacy of your seed away by watching your heart, even in the midst of the storm, in the midst of surviving the storm, in the midst of recovery. Break, break free and let, you know, all hurt and pain, let them go. Break free of them. No matter who, you know, it was that you are blaming or whether uh, it's a tragedy, you know, that, that you can't even explain, whatever it is. I don't even know who Ruth will be blaming in that situation. Probably just blaming God because nobody killed a husband. The, the guy just died. And in some situations... A bitter breakup, you're blaming your friends, you're blaming your, you know, your ex, you're blaming parents, you're blaming other people. It's time to put an end to all that blame game and allow God to move you into full recovery. And that will be the testimony of someone here in the precious name of Jesus. Somebody say, better amen. You know, the Bible encouraged us to keep, just keep sowing seed. Psalm 126, when you read verse 5 and 6, Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6, it says, those who sow in tears. So it's possible to be crying and still be adding value. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continue, uh, uh, continually goes forth, weeping and bearing seeds for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, carrying his sheaves with him. It's harvest with him. Some people in just a relationship breakdown, you stop caring. You, 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 you allow the, the devil to, to, to bring wickedness into your heart. We hear about relationship breakdown where somebody who has the means to pay children's school fees and pay accommodation say, I'm not going to do that again. Just because a woman turned herself against you, then everybody has to be punished for it, including your children. You don't mind if they're on the streets. That's not a Christian way. 
uh, to walk through a relationship storm. You have to keep adding value according as God has given you capacity. There's always a seed in your heart, in your hand, that God wants you to release. So don't overfocus on your need, also focus on your seed. The last thought for this message, repentance brings revival and restoration. And I'm speaking to somebody who knows that you need to repent of certain things if you're going to be able to survive this storm. That maybe some things you've done in relationship brought the storm. You know, if you remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, uh, in Luke 15, the Bible talks about Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son, it was, he was the one that initiated a transition in his life, asked for his inheritance, and went off to a strange country, lived riotously, uh, and his life, you know, went south to the point that he couldn't even feed himself. He had to be feeding uh, with pigs. But one thing happened. It came to a place of repentance. Can I speak to somebody today who needs to come to that place of a turnaround, repentance, changing your mind, turn from your, from, from your mistakes and your errors. You are not your mistakes. You may have cheated in a relationship. You may have broken your, your vows. But that's not who you are. See yourself in the light of Christ, the giver of grace, the one who transforms lives. You may be, you, may, you, you know, you may have been a perpetual liar. You may be, your heart may be riddled with envy and it destroys a relationship. Or maybe it's insecurity that is destroying that relationship, uh, that is bringing a storm into your life and into that relationship. It says, time for you to ask God for grace, for a turnaround. In Luke 15, verse 17, the prodigal son, look at how it's put in the NIV, in the New International Version, in verse 15, 17 of Luke 15, it says, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, that's the prodigal son, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. Somebody needs to say, look, sometimes we need to accept I brought this storm on myself. I need the help of God. I brought this storm on myself. I need the help of God. Maybe somebody's saying that with me today. And God uh, that you are entreating is coming true for you this season. Grace is coming upon you to see you through that process of repentance that will lead to restoration and a revival in your life in the name of Jesus. And when you've come to that point, you also need to activate a godly action plan that will lead to full restoration. That was what the prodigal son did. When you read the, the, the following verse, uh, uh, verse 18 and 19, I read it in the New Living Translation. It says, I will go home to my father and say, so he, he marshaled a plan, an action plan. I will go home to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. Not just God. Sometimes we don't only sin against God, we sin against human beings. And we need to accept, I wronged my spouse. Yeah. That business part, I cheated my business partner. That was what brought this relationship storm. My heart was not clean concerning that project. Something, you need to accept, I spoke too much. I was stonewalling my spouse. And you know, stonewalling in a marriage is like acid rain on your, on, on your partner. Yeah. When you make people feel neglected, feel rejected, feel valueless, feel useless. It's time to repent, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to repent. And activate a godly plan that will lead to restoration. This guy said, I'll go to my father. I will tell my father, I've sinned against you, uh, against heaven, both heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy. To be called your son. Please take me as one of your hired servants. Sometimes we need to come to terms with the fact that I'm no longer worthy to be a partner in this relationship. I messed things up. I'm asking that you forgive me. I'm asking uh, that you reconsider your position. May God give somebody a heart of humility to be able to seek the path of repentance, renewal, and restoration. In the precious name of Jesus.
in the precious name of Jesus. Hosea chapter 6, when you read uh, from verse 1 to 3 in Amplified Translation, it says, Come and let us return in repentance to the Lord. For he has torn us apart, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will uh, bandage us. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. Many scriptures in the Bible emphasize the need for repentance. Even in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, the popular scripture reading from New King James Version, it says, if my people who are called by my name, my people, my covenant people called by my name, your Christianity or being joined to God will not excuse you from a time of, of repentance when you need to repent. But it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Will humble themselves. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, uh, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, so then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. May healing come upon your home. May healing come upon that business. May healing come upon your life this season. That healing will come uh, through genuine repentance, through humility. God is a healer. And we can count on his faithfulness all of the time. But we must remain humble enough to repent every now and then, every now and again. We must learn to repent consistently. And I'm speaking to somebody here today. Who feels, I don't need anything to repent from. Maybe you need to check your heart very well. Maybe you need to check your heart about what brought that storm. Sometimes we blame a storm only on one person. And Jesus said you need to take away the log in your own eyes before you take away the speck in somebody else's eyes. And when we distribute, you know, uh, blames like that, we, we, we absorb ourselves. And it, it, it keeps us in our, in our pride. And we don't want to. To repent. Repentance allows us to identify and prevent the reoccurrence of actions that battered storms or disappointments in the past. Yeah, that's what it does. Repentance allows us to identify and prevent the reoccurrence of the actions that battered storms and that brought disappointments in time past. Can I say this as I close? God is bigger than your mistakes. God is bigger than your guilt. God is bigger than all of your shame. He wants to clean away the shame, take away the guilt, help you to see your mistake from a new point of view. Bring beauty out of the ashes of your failure. He doesn't want to judge you by your failure. Jesus, you know, uh, in, in, in the book of John, as I conclude today, the book of John, Jesus looked at the woman caught in adultery. The people condemned her. They wanted to stone her. But Jesus looked at her. The Bible says when Jesus, John chapter 8 from verse 10, it says when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Where are those who accuse you? And has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And that's what Jesus is saying to somebody here today. Somebody like a prodigal son who brought a storm into a relationship. God is saying, uh, all I want from you is humility. I don't condemn. Don't focus on the, the guilt because God is taking it away right now. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at Elevation NG to have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.